Uh, I love the book of Proverbs. Psalms, not as much, but I do read. I don't neglect God's word. I still read them. I'm finding much more value in Psalms the older I get in life and the more difficulties I go through in life because Psalms is also from the Lord, and it's not so much that it's not from God that I don't like it. It's that it's not my personality. My personality is not one where I share my feelings and talk about what I'm going through and all those kind of things, but I'm beginning to see the value of that. I feel better many times when I let things out, right? I just feel better. But I used to think, well, that's not faith to go in. Sometimes you go, you know, you go in your room and you, you don't feel good and you say, God, where are you? You promised this, is, you know, why is all this happening? Now, a lot of you ladies and some men, I, I shouldn't categorize people that way, but you don't have a problem expressing your feelings. It's something you've always done, and you feel better when you do it. Uh, your husband may not always feel better, but you always feel better. <laughs> now, now, of course, men, so there are some men that have no problems doing that, but I have a problem doing that, and I often saw it as a lack of faith to go into my room and say, God, I just, I, where are you? I feel alone. But then you read through the Psalms, and you realize many of them, or all of them were written by men, but King David wrote a great deal of them, and King David is known as a man of faith. And here he is expressing many times, my enemies are coming against me, um, the, all the things that are happening in my life. And he'd go through this whole thing, and at the very end he said, but God, you're gonna, you're, it's going to work out in the end. And I'm starting to see the value of that. I'm starting to learn something from that. It's kind of changing me as a person. But we're going to be in Psalms 119. If you were to take five Psalms a day, and reading it through in a month. Uh, this is going to be your biggest struggle, Psalms 119. It's one of the longest psalms in the Bible. Uh, I do it just because that's just the way that I am. But at the very end, in uh, verse 169 through 70, the psalmist says, Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my plea come before you. Deliver me according to your word. Now, in this part of the psalm, the psalmist is going through a difficult time. He's struggling because if you were to go back just a few verses in 157, he says, many are my persecutors and my adversaries, but I do not swerve from your testimonies. So he, he has times when he's going through difficulties, and here he is crying out to the Lord, let my cry come before you according to your word. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my cleat come before you. Deliver me according to your word. Now, while we may all not go through difficulties at the same time, you can't live this life very long without encountering difficulties. It just happens. It's part of life. Like the psalmist, it could be people. Maybe your difficulty is other people. Maybe your difficulty is the per people that's in the mirror every morning when you, stand, when, you, when you comb your hair. It could be ourselves. Maybe your difficulties are financial. Maybe your difficulties are physical. Maybe your difficulties are emotional. Maybe they're addictions. There's so many things that we encounter in life that could become difficulties to people. If we live life very long, we can be sure we are going to encounter stuff. And if it's not in your life, it may be in the life of somebody that's part of who you are, your family, your relatives. We all struggle with difficulties in life. It's just part of life. But in our text, the psalmist is seeking to live life according to God's word. He's struggling to make sense of life and be faithful to the Lord and his promises. And that's oftentimes a challenge because we know that God is all-powerful. He has given us his precious promises, yet the difficulties in life we face oftentimes clash with how we perceive the godly life should be and often how we perceive that God should move in our life. It's a battle on the outside, and oftentimes it's a battle on the inside. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Again, our text says the psalmist cries to the Lord, but he also asks for understanding according to his word, his truth. He's saying, help me, Lord, but also help me understand why. Because my difficulties um, um, contradict your seeming, or, or I should say, your seeming unwillingness to move like I expect. It contradicts what I believe or how I believe you to be and how I believe that you should behave. I'm serving you, Lord. I'm committed to serving you, but I'm having a hard time 
please give me understanding. But here's the key. Not according to the way I want, but according to your word, not mine. According to your word, not my feelings. Because a lot of times my feelings will betray the under, what God wants to share with me in his word. Right? Now, how many of you know that feelings are good things? Please don't ever come away from my teaching with the fact that feelings are bad things. Feelings are great. You have feelings because God gave you feelings. But I don't know. Uh, I heard this illustration. It was one of the best ways that I heard to understand how you should handle feelings. Some of us are more strongly connected with our feelings than others. Uh, but feelings are like children. They're wonderful, beautiful gifts from God. But if you never discipline them, they'll grow up and they'll take over your house. Right? It's the same thing with the feelings that we have, whether they're stronger, you might say you have more children or less children, whatever the case may be. If you don't steward your feelings and put them in their place and, and, and discipline those feelings in your life, if you're not careful, they'll run your life. So it's not about whether you have feelings or not and how I feel about life. It's God, give me understanding according to your word because his word is true. His word is forever settled in the heavens, right? In other words, it doesn't matter if we burned every Bible there is on the planet. If we never had a copy of a scroll ever available to us, it's not going to change his word. His word is forever established in the heavens. Amen? So his word is truth, not how I feel about his word, not how I feel about my situations. It's his word that's true. And the psalmist is saying, give me understanding according to your word. Okay, now I'm going to halt there for a minute and just kind of do an aside, but it's part of what I'm teaching. But this is how I was struggling with and working through this process. And if you were to go to Numbers, you don't have to turn there, but I'll give you the reference, Numbers chapter 21, 4 through 8. The Bible says that the Israelites were going through the wilderness, and while they were going through the wilderness, what do the people often do when they're not happy? They grumble and complain. The Israelites began to grumble and complain, and they spoke against the Lord, and as a result, serpents were released among the people. Anybody remember that text? The serpents were released among the people, and um, how many of you understand that if you're in the desert and there's a bunch of serpents uh, around you trying to bite you, that could be called a difficulty, right? <laughs> That's a difficulty in life. Okay, now, Keep that in mind. I'm going to go to another passage in Acts 28, 1 through 5. In this passage, Paul had done nothing wrong. So in the first passage, I just talked to you about servants. The reason the servants were released because the people did something wrong. In this passage in Acts 28, Paul had done nothing wrong. He was, in, he was uh, in captivity because he was preaching the word of God, but he didn't do anything wrong. He was put on a ship to go to Rome to, to be tried before Caesar, but he hadn't done anything wrong. In fact, you might, be able, you might be willing to say that the reason he was in captivity is because other people had done something wrong. And here he is on an island trying to help people. He's already gone through a shipwreck because of what other, people, other people's bad decisions. He's gone through a shipwreck. He's on an island. They're trying to build a fire. Everybody's just escaped. They're wet. They're hungry. They're building a fire. He's gathering firewood to help people. And while he's doing something good, a snake comes out and bites his hand. Right? Now, so I bring those two perspectives for this particular reason. In, uh, in Luke chapter 4, 18 and 19, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because, he's given, because he has anointed me, me to preach good news to the poor. He's anointed me to do what? To proclaim, to set prisoners free and to proclaim release to the captives. Now, to understand what, those, what that means is you have to understand a prisoner is in jail because of something they've done. Right? A prisoner is in jail or boxed in because of something that they've done. A captive is in jail because of something somebody else has done. Right? So this is where I'm trying to go with the snakes. Sometimes there's difficulties in our life because of stuff that we've done. I mean, just be honest. Everybody here has done stuff. You did stuff before you were a Christian. That's why you became a Christian. You've done stuff since you became a Christian. That's why you still keep coming to church. No, just kidding. <laughs> if anyone has sinned, yeah, you know, uh, can, can, uh, how does that scripture go, First John? If any man sins, confess your sins. 
He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That promise was made to the church, right? Because we mess up. Sometimes stuff comes into our life because we do stuff wrong. We've messed up. But sometimes things come into our life not because we've done anything wrong, but just because life happens. Maybe you can go back and say, yeah, other people have done something wrong. You can go all the way back to Adam and Eve. It says it's all Adam and Eve's fault. You know, everything got messed up when Adam and Eve sinned. Well, that's true. There's a reality into that. The enemy was released into this, into this atmosphere, and he had more sway into this atmosphere because of the authority that Adam gave him when he sinned and, and submitted himself to the word of the enemy. But the bottom line is, whether it's because we've done something wrong or whether it's because something else, somebody else has done something wrong, we all face stuff in life, Right? My point is, is sometimes there's an obvious reason and sometimes there it's not. There's not. Sometimes it's because we've done something wrong. Sometimes it's because of others and they've done something wrong. And the bottom line is John 10 and 10. The thief comes in to steal, kill, and destroy. We may not always know why, but one thing we will find is that there's always an answer. And the answer is found in God. Give me understanding according to your word. Now, here's where we're going to uh, go a little bit and elaborate on this, and this is where I want to go. There's always an answer. It's always found in God, but it may not always match up to what you think the answer is supposed to be. All right. John 1, 1 and 14 says, Jesus is the word made flesh. Luke 4, 18 and 19, Jesus said the Spirit of the Lord was, its, uh, was upon him to set prisoners and captives free. I already uh, shared that with you. Acts 10, 38, the Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good, healing all those that were oppressed of the enemy. So there's always an answer. The answer is always in God. It's found in Christ. But while, but while we get that, and while we understand that, the problem that we have is that we don't always see the visible results of our situation. We don't always see the visible results impacting the things that we're going through in life the way that we expect. I cried out to the Lord, but I'm still sick. I cried out to the Lord, but I'm still stuck. Doesn't the Bible says he brought me out of the miry clay? He set my feet upon a rock to... Stay. You ever found yourself in miry clay? Have you ever found yourself stuck? He cried out to the Lord and you're still stuck. Right? You say, Pastor, you're not preaching faith. Well, I will in a minute. I'm just dealing with reality. I cried out to the Lord because I was hurting and I'm still hurting. I cried out to the Lord because financially I was in trouble and I'm still in trouble. My family's still sick. We're still oppressed. I'm still battling my addiction. I don't understand. The psalmist says, give me understanding according to your word. What I want to tell you is there's always an answer, and we know that answer is, you learn this in children's church, always Jesus. That has to be the basis for everything that Jesus is the answer to it all. I don't have all the answers for your particular situation, but Jesus, who is the Word, and the Word of God does address some of those answers, and one of them in particular I want to deal with here this morning. Where I began with is in the book of Psalms, but I want to turn here, and here's where I do want you to turn is with me to the book of Habakkuk. Are you all following me this morning? I'm, I feel a little disjointed, but are you all following where I'm going? Okay, because if not, I can start over. I'll probably do it better the second time. <laughs> Habakkuk. Habakkuk, if you were to read this book, is struggling because he lives in the nation of Judah. Israel and Judah were supposed to be the people of God. He's a prophet to that nation. And he's looking around at the people of God and he sees that everything is not going well. People are not living for God. He's struggling because to him it seems like the wicked are prospering in the land of God's anointing, God's temple. And therefore to him it seems like justice is perverted. 
So he cries out to God, and God responds that the people will be judged by the Babylonians whom God is sending his way. Something, he is telling Habakkuk, is going to be done, God replies. But the problem is Habakkuk doesn't like the reply because Habakkuk says the Babylonians are worse than the people that are in the land. You're using people that are wicked to judge the people that I think are wicked, but they're more righteous than the wicked. God, you can't do that. He's struggling with God's reply. Habakkuk doesn't like it. How could you, God, use a people to carry out your purpose that are not righteous? They're not just. And so he lays that out before the Lord, and he cries out to God again. And in Habakkuk chapter 2, 2 through 4, the Lord answers him, and he says, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he, who, so he may run who reads it, for still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens, hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul, the Chaldeans, is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. In verse 3, it says, the vision awaits is the, the appointed time. So what I gather out of this is this. The answer is coming. All things will be made right. It's just that your perspective is too limited. The Babylonians will be judged. Everything will be put right. Justice will prevail, but it doesn't always happen, Habakkuk, on your time frame. And one of the things that we need to realize as people of God is that God is just. God is good. He has an answer. He will always come through, but unfortunately, he doesn't always do it on our time frame. Not the answer we wanted. Right? But listen, I'm not here just to give you the answer we want. I'm here to try to reveal to you what this psalmist was crying out. Give me understanding according to your word. Now, how many of you know that his word is true? Now, we're not in any way trying to deny you hope. We're not in any way trying to deny you faith because as some of you already realize, God answers many times right away. Boom. We love that. We will continue to believe for that. I love it when I pray for somebody that can't move his arm, and they move their arm. I, we have children running around here because they were dead in the womb, and God touched them, and now they're running around, and they're uh, boys and girls running around through the sanctuary because God had to do an instantaneous miracle at that time. We love that, right? That's awesome. We're going to continue to believe for that. But sometimes we also have, I know some of you, and I'm going through something too. I pray, I cry out, and it's like, man, I see all these people, they get instantaneous miracles. God does all these things, in it, and I got to go to a chiropractor. I'm having a hard time with that, you know? And so, God, are you faithful? Of course he's faithful. God, are you good? Of course he's good. God, are you going to bring me through? Of course I'm going to bring you through. But it may not always happen on your time frame. So what do we do? The just shall live by faith. You still have to trust in God's word. Not because we have to, but because we know that he is faithful. Listen, when one of my moments uh, when I go through difficulties, and I don't ever share this, I, again, I'm really quiet. I don't like to make my feelings known, but I've been really going through a battle this week. And, you know, it, it just crying out to God. And I say, God, I'm struggling because I want to say, where are you? But yet I know you're good because the very fact that I can talk to you and have a relationship with you and cry out to you tells me that you're good because I know you and you know me. And so I'm going back. I, I was... Uh, I was uh, watching this video, some of you probably saw it on posted on Facebook, of a mother that had her two-year-old daughter in Dollar General, and she's passed out, they said, from a drug overdose. And the daughter's, Mama, Mama, trying to get her mom up, and they're doing this video. And, and I'm watching that, and I'm thinking, they're taking the video, calling 911, but nobody's picking up the daughter, you know? And I was like, somebody go over there and pick up the daughter, you know? That's what I, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I just start bawling and crying. Go get that girl. I had to turn it off. It was so emotionally. And I said, why is it bothering me so much? Because in some ways, I'm like that little girl saying, Daddy, where are you? Why don't you come pick me up? 
You ever felt that way? And it's just real. We're not denying faith. We're not denying the Lord. But sometimes you're like, where are you, Papa? I need you now. And God's good. Sheds a little light here. Tells you through other people. People come. They'll say a little word. And if you keep your eyes open and your ears open, he's always saying, I'm there. I love you. I'm with you. I'm for you. But the reality is you're still hurting. You're still facing difficulties. Nothing is really getting better. But God says and promises in his word that he has the answer. He is the answer. It's coming. So the struggle that we have is it's not happening on my time frame. Right? I want it, and I want it now. I told you this, but it happened to me. Uh, I came in and was preaching on Friday night, and they asked me to get something. My daughter wanted something on the way home, so I go to McDonald's. There's two lanes. I get into one lane, and I make an assessment. I said, the other lane's going faster, so I get in the other lane. And then I realize when I get in the other lane, two other cars, this other lane starts going. You know, you just never pick right. I ended up spending 25 minutes in this drive through line. It didn't matter which lane you go through. I ended up spending 25 minutes. I was hurt. I said, the worst time for me to be in a 25-minute line because it hurts me to sit down. Here I am. And you're just like, goodness, you know, it's like the battle that I'm having is I want it, and I want it now. You ever had that? <laughs> Doesn't always happen on our time frame, but we still have to trust his word. The righteous will live by faith, trust in God and his righteous ways, even when it seems like the answer is being delayed. James chapter 1, 2 through 4, you know the scripture, count it all joy when you go through difficult situations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh perseverance. But let perseverance have its perfect work so that you may be complete. That word complete means mature. In other words, you are not mature until you learn how to persevere. Ugh. And say, I, I don't think that's God. <laughs> Guess what? You don't learn how to persevere until you have a reason to persevere. This is what I'm telling you. You don't learn how to persevere until you have a reason to persevere. For some of us, we learn how to persevere when we get married. Right? Not a lot of today's society is learning that because a lot of society today is I'm in love if I'm happy. And when I get married and I'm no longer happy, I must not therefore be in love, so therefore I'm not supposed to be married anymore. That's not God's definition of marriage. God's definition of marriage is you make a covenant. You covenant that you're going to be together, and I will tell you that if you get married, it's not always going to be high. There's a lot of lows in marriage. But God says, lo, I am with you always. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you covenant to be together through the highs and the lows. And you know what you learn how to do? Learn how to persevere. You learn how to walk it out. And it changes you. You become a different person. Changes who you are when you learn how to persevere. That word persevere again means, that word complete means mature. You see, it may not always, uh, here's the thing you don't realize about that text, is that the Israelites were Christians, they were Jewish Christians, but there was a persecution breaking out in Jerusalem. And so when the persecution broke out, here they are, people that believe in God, seeing the miracles and the powers of God, seeing the favor of God on their lives, but they're having to run from their homes. They're having to leave their belongings. They're having to leave their way of life. Many of them have to leave their businesses. They have to leave their possessions. They have to leave everything they have. They are running for their lives. And they're crying out to God, and God gives them an answer through James, and he says, the trying of your faith works perseverance. That's not what I want to hear. I want to hear that God's going to bring everything back. He's going to restore me tenfold. He's going to give my, all the, my belongings. Every, I, everything's going to be. I don't want to hear that it's working perseverance in my life. But that's what it's doing. Right? Why? Because you need perseverance to be perfect and complete. See, I'm not just looking for understanding. I want understanding according to your word. That's a lot harder. God, 
The answer is not what I want. I want you to deliver me now. I want you to make things right now. I want you to heal me now. And you can go on and on. I don't want him to work on me. I want him to work for me. Work on them. Work for me. Give me understanding according to your word, the psalmist says. But then he remembers that God also promised to deliver him. Deliver me according to your word. So give me understanding, but I still want deliverance. The psalmist sees that deliverance is promised in God's word, and it is, but not always in our time. And there is an answer. His name is Jesus. And it's our privilege to trust when things are good. And it's our privilege to trust when things are not. It's our privilege to trust when we understand. And it's our privilege to trust when we do not. He knows what he is doing. He's good. He's for us. He's not against us. But why am I still going through this difficulty? I don't always know. But I have to learn, and I'm committed to trust. Why? The Bible says one day in your courts are better than a thousand elsewhere. I like what one pastor said. It doesn't say a thousand what. We assume it means a thousand days, but it could be a thousand anything. One day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere. And the way I translate that is my best, my worst day in the kingdom is infinitely better than my best day without. No matter how bad it gets, sometimes in my life, knowing God, I still know God. And he knows me. And I I think about, I could be going through the same stuff without God. And you know, I, I'm, I'm amazed. I have, I've developed a newfound amazement. And I don't mean this in a negative way or ironic way or a demeaning way. I have a newfound amazement for people that don't know God and go through stuff and they keep going. It, it's incredible the amount of strength that some people have. I don't have that. I don't need to have that because I know God and God knows me. And no matter how bad things get, I got the privilege every morning of going before the Lord and saying, God, I don't understand. It's difficult. But realizing that I'm talking to the creator of the universe. And somehow when I finish, I feel like it's going to be okay. I don't know how. I don't know when. But it's going to be okay. I'll finish with another psalmist in Psalm 73. I'll come back and just read one passage in Habakkuk, but I'm done, basically. I want to finish with another psalmist in Psalm 73. Psalm 73, 1 through 3. This psalmist is having a hard time. Same thing, he's struggling. You never know. Might even be the same psalm, psalmist that wrote the other psalm because it's a very similar situation. Psalm 73, I won't read the whole thing. I'm just going to read 1 and 3 and then 16 and 17. He says this. He said, Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. In other words, he's an Israelite and he's looking around And it seems like people that don't know God, people that don't live for God, in his eyes, they seem to be doing a whole lot better than he was, and he was trying to live for God. You ever felt like that? Did you know this was in the Psalms? It's in the Psalms. So what happens? If you jump down to verse 16 and 17, he goes on, he cries out, they never have problems, I have problems, this never happens, and then he goes and does all that kind of stuff, and but he gets to verse 16, and verse 16 he says, But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God and I discerned their end. In other words, even though everything looks good now, when it all comes to the conclusion, 
they're not going to end very well. And you know, we don't talk about this very much, but we need to remember that this is not all there is to life. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And you know, the reality is, I wish that we were all whole, and I'm believing for that, and I'm believing it will always be that way. I wish that we never had any difficulties in life. I wish that we would all prosper and be in health, even if we're so prosper. I think that's God's desire for us. I want that to happen in our life. But the reality is, if you read Hebrews, some people had faith and saw God miraculously work. Other people had faith, and they were sawn in two. But this life is not all there is. We're not living just for what can happen in this life. God's promised us a home with him. And one day, no more pain. One day, the difficulties that we face now, we'll never have to face again. We get to be with God forever. And you can look around and say, it's not right. It's not just the wicked are prospering, the bad things that happen to them like it happens to me. But one day we're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to stand with God and God's going to stand with us and he's going to say, these are my children. You've suffered in life, just like that man that stood before the rich man. He suffered in life, and the rich man seemed like everything was going good, but when everything finished, he was in hell asking that uh, just uh, this man would just touch the tip of his finger with water and moisten his tongue, while the guy that had suffered all his life was sitting at the feet of Abraham. Why? Because in the end, justice does prevail. And I want to encourage you, no matter what, we're going to continue to believe. We're going to continue to pray. We're going to continue to see God do awesome things. But if you don't see it, the just will live by faith. Continue to trust because in the end, it will all work out. We're not just living for this life. We're living for life eternal. We work to bring heaven to earth because we've so long just tried to go to heaven that we've neglected the other part of the gospel, which is God wants to impact our lives and this world with heaven as well. But we can forget that we are going to heaven one day. But we have to believe and persevere and continue to walk and trust that God is faithful. And this is where I said, I want to finish in Habakkuk because it ends everything. This is who God is talking to. And God said, write it down. Everything's going to be just in the end. It's going to work out. Justice is going to prevail. But in the meantime, it's not. But here's how Habakkuk finishes in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. God tells us, God tells him, quietly wait for what I'm telling you to happen because it's going to happen. And Habakkuk, it says, my, my heading says, Habakkuk rejoices in the Lord. And Habakkuk says, though the fig tree should not blossom. What's a fig tree supposed to do? It's supposed to blossom, produce fruit. But he says, though the fig tree does not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. In other words, when everything looks really bad, even though all this stuff is happening, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. I don't ever want to forget that my strength, my promise, my inheritance is the God of my salvation. And one day, we'll fight for it here, but one day, everything is going to be all right.